Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and life coach Cindy Chavez here, and on this Wednesday, October the 17th, 2018, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, your second daily dose of happy for the day, a phrase that Cindy is still getting used to, but I think she's gotten partway used to it anyway by now, having done a few of these afternoon episodes. Um, but uh, it must be nice to actually be awake when you're doing the episode during the afternoon, right? <laughs> That's funny. Yes, I am actually awake. Hopefully, I, I'm faking it well enough in the morning where I sound like I'm actually awake. You really uh, do. You do a great job of it. I mean, I don't think anybody else knows except me because you tell me, oh, my God, I just woke up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I'm used to waking up in my whole life. Like when I wake up, I'm immediately wide awake. And there have been a couple times this week where I've woke up and it's been like 5 a.m. So I've gone back to sleep. And my alarm has woken me up. And that's a totally different story because mm. I think both times my alarm woke me up in the middle of the deepest part of my sleep cycle. And I was like, oh, my goodness, really, really had a hard time waking up. Luckily, I set my alarm to where it's early enough to where I'm completely fully awake by the time I <laughs> join you in the morning. But Well, that's good. I mean, I'm glad to hear that you're not half asleep. I mean, because your advice is good either way. I mean, the, the the commentary you make is really, really good. And if you're doing it in your sleep, I, I'm more credit to you is what I look at it. <laughs> that's really funny. Well, you know, this, it just, um, the more you practice, the easier it gets, right? So, right. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Know, people say, oh, I could talk about this in my sleep. Well, <laughs> I, I probably can. <laughs> I probably can. So, yeah. So, no, it's good to be here in the afternoon. It's kind of like um, I have a practice of certain things that I do at the end of my day that sort of mark the end of my day in the office. You know, like I used to – I work on a uh, on a desktop computer now, but when I worked on a laptop, that was one of the things. It's like when I was finished, I would – sign out, close up, mm. you know, unplug. I was like, done. And it was sort of like, okay, I'm not going to drift back over here and start working again. I'm, right, I'm right. Finished. And the fun thing about Wednesdays is that I literally start my day and end my day in the office with the LOA Today podcast. So oh, that's, well, that's a good really, thing. That's a really yeah. good thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's, an, it's a nice way to start. And end the day. That's good. And it's been raining here nonstop all day long. So, so you weren't going anywhere anyway. <laughs> no, not really. Okay. I always say I don't mind the rain as long as I don't have to go out in it. Right. I'm not a big fan of being out. I, I don't like to drive in the rain. No, no. A lot no. of people don't. I don't blame you. I mean, it's not all that yeah. much fun, to be perfectly honest. But uh, so anyway, we are. Uh, we're, we've been talking about the book "Out of This World" by Neville Goddard, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, this morning's podcast made an impression on a number of people, including one of my new co-hosts, which is pretty cool. Carlos Balasquita, he's going to be joining me on Tuesdays, along with Alex King, Tuesday afternoon. And he texted me that he had listened to this morning's podcast. And, and he was even so kind as to, to send me some ideas about what I could do. Because remember, I was talking this morning about how sometimes I have trouble you know, doing the, the, the feeling part of getting into, you know, assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled when I'm doing a meditation. So he was giving me these right. ideas and um, basically faking it till you make it, you know, kind of stuff, which was great. I mean, I love it. First Excellent. of all, you know, he's he's just joined the podcast. He's already listening in to find out what's going on and so forth. I mean, he's he's involved already. Um, Wonderful. And, and, and he also made a point too, which was he didn't realize that. I mean, he he said he's got to get a copy of the book, and I and I realized we didn't really announce. Yes, or this morning anyway, that the book is just available online. You can just go to a website that's set up for it. That's where we're um, accessing it. Um, so anyone who wants to follow along, we're at nevillegoddardoutofthisworld.org. And it's the whole book just laid out right there. There's even It looks like there's an audio version of it. Is that what I'm seeing there? Yes. There is. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. You, know, you can just follow right along. Don't, don't do the audio version because it'll interfere with the podcast. But <laughs> other than that... <laughs> Yeah, follow right along. Right. Plus, we usually take it a little bit at a time and do a lot of discussing in between the paragraphs. So exactly, yeah. Follow, yeah. 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 So. Well, you know, you were talking about tapping into the feeling that it's an integral part of Neville Goddard's teaching, right? right? Assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled, mm -hmm. and then the other part we have talked about. Well, that kind of hit me this morning was the idea that when we 
take that action to assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled, to use our imagination to go over that little vignette that we've uh, created, that it's very important that we do it with the idea that it's happening now and not that it's not that mentally we're still projecting that this is something I'm imagining that's going to happen in the future. Right. And I think that's a really fine distinction to make because I recognize that sometimes even though I am feeling it and I am, you know, creating this little scenario in my imagination right now, there may be still part of me that is kind of projecting it or sensing that, okay, this is something that's in the future. Oh, yeah. Right. And so today when we were reading, um, it, it got very it can sound very complicated when he goes into this fourth dimensional thing and yeah. all of that. But what hit me when I, we got finished, I thought, okay, the world that we inhabit that we generally think of is the place we are living is the three dimensional world. Right. Right. And he's talking about this fourth dimension. And I thought, okay, so in the three dimensional world, I inhabit a space that has a boundary of my body. And my body, which isn't very big, right? I have a limited space. I don't take up a lot of space. And I, I inhabit this three-dimensional world that is shown to me by spaces. Like I'm in an office right now. It mm-hmm. has a certain size. And it's, it's got a boundary and all of these things. But my imagination is not bounded by those things. True. Like I can sit here, shut my eyes, and suddenly, you know, I'm drinking tea right now, as usual. But, you know, if I want to use my imagination and taste a lemon or a coffee, I can. And mm. if I want to imagine that I'm sitting up there in your studio, mm-hmm. right? Sure. In New England, then I can. So my imagination is not held by those boundaries. And my imagination is what he is saying, I believe, is my dimensionally larger self. It's larger than this boundary of my body. Oh, good point. And it inhabits a dimensionally larger space, which is that fourth dimension. Mm -hmm. And in that space, everything happens right now. So when I'm using my imagination to create this scenario, this little vignette I've decided on, it is happening right now in that dimension. And thinking of it that way, just helped me to be able today already twice or three times. I don't know. I'm having so much fun with this. method. <laughs> I've been able to, and I timed it. I have a, you know, timer on my phone and it was, I put my timer for 90 seconds, kind of going on with that Abraham idea that we were talking about right. 17 seconds and yeah. then 68 seconds or whatever. I just went for 90. And what was so cool was that, in the moments that I finished up the scenario and I was feeling so good, I was just feeling like I was on cloud nine. Wow. Bing. <laughs> I thought, <laughs> yes. So 90 seconds, you know, now I did take, I did take 15 or 20 seconds to relax my body. And I think it's probably optimal if you can take even longer than that. But mm. I was just sort of showing myself that I can do this. I can do it all throughout the day if I can just take a couple of minutes to relax. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. How much you can get done in 90 seconds. That's a minute and a half. That's not that long. It's not that long. No. Yeah. <laughs> so I just, I wanted to bring that up because of that whole section we read this morning about, you know, the the larger, the dimensionally larger space and these different dimensions and time and all of that. I thought, you know, it's, it's sort of easy when you look at it this way. It's that my imagination is not bounded by these dimensions. Yeah, it's a good point. And you're right. It does simplify it uh, for a number of reasons, not the least of which is because, like you said, what you did took 90 seconds. It was 90 seconds of essentially meditating and getting into the feeling. And he took an entire chapter to describe that. And, and that kind of makes sense. I mean, if you, if you, how would you describe that otherwise, right? How, how would you yeah. describe that whole process without giving an, a great amount of detail so that somebody really understands, you know, in every way possible what it is they're expected to do? So, yeah, I mean, your, your, your summary really hits it on the nail, hits the nail on the head, rather, that well, it's about being in the is, now. If you're, if you're doing it 
for the enjoyment of it because it feels great to do it, right? I mean, you are imagining what you would feel like or what would be happening if you'd already accomplished this thing you want to accomplish. So, of course, it's going to feel great. And if you're doing it to tap into that great feeling, then you are definitely in the now with it. You're doing it for now. In the same way that if I go get an ice cream cone, I'm getting it so I can eat it right now and enjoy it. I'm not going to sit it here on the counter and just think about it and <laughs> think about that it's in the future. <laughs> Watch it drip, drip, drip. <laughs> right. So it's like, okay, let's do this now. Like we can do it now. And I think that that's a really important part of the process is keeping it in the now and doing it for the enjoyment of it now. Um, it creates, that's what starts to create that momentum. So anyway, I wanted to talk about that before we did promos, before we hopped into chapter two. Right, because I, right ready to go excited about i can it. tell <laughs> yeah it's pretty evident i mean clearly <laughs> afternoon podcasts agree with you in a big way <laughs> so yeah let's get the promos done first of all um as everyone knows our primary promo is subscription if you're not yet a subscriber please do become one i've been watching the numbers lately cindy and it varies from day to day because you know you never know who's tuning in on any one day but typically somewhere between 20 and 30 20 and 33 percent of the people listening on any given day are not subscribers. And they're the ones we're trying to reach with this particular promo. We're trying to urge all of them, become a subscriber because you don't just have to get just this one episode. You can get all the episodes coming right to your phone every single time that we record them automatically. And then you just go to your podcast app, open it up and play them whenever you want to play them, whenever you need to get a little daily dose of happy. Um, the subscription process is really easy. A lot of people know how to do it these days. If you have a little trouble with it, we have it all written out with easy-to-click links, great big icons. You can hardly miss them on the homepage of our website at loatoday.net. So please do become a subscriber because you're going to love it. I mean, our existing subscribers tell us how much they love it. Um, who, who was it who uh, uh, tweeted you yesterday, Cindy, about how he was a binge listener? He, he was one of the uh, uh, well-cited binge listeners that we had, which is pretty cool. Right. I love that we have <laughs> people that are binge listening. Exactly. And it's a great way to do it, especially when we are covering a book and we're kind of going through yeah, it from right? episode to episode, right? Just like take it all in. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then we also want to remind people who are already subscribers, both new subscribers and long time existing subscribers to please keep posting on your favorite social media site, something about LOAToday.net. Just include that phrase, LOAToday.net. It is working in a big way to help us include, increase our numbers. And, and we really appreciate all of you who've been doing it and we ask you to keep doing it. And for those who haven't been helping out, hey, come on, give us a hand. We need you. To, we need your help too. So please, everybody, just keep uh, posting out there on social media. In fact, I was telling you about this uh, earlier today, Cindy. I am now experimenting with getting us to the point where we can do live streaming on Facebook while we are recording these programs. And as I told you just before the podcast, it is a mess trying to set the thing up. There's a whole lot of stuff you have to do, but. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to get it all set up so that we can be doing live um, live streaming on Facebook. Because among other things, I mean, there are a lot of people on Facebook who are Law of Attraction followers and people interested in it and so forth. I mean, you just look at the groups that are associated with Law of Attraction. There are like tens of thousands of people joining each of these groups. And we're going to try to reach those people by live streaming. So it's going to be a good fun. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's like we were talking this morning about the the quote that, you know, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I just marvel every day that we really are sort of like the Jetsons, right? Mm -hmm. We have yeah. so much technology at our fingertips and it's wonderful to be using it in this way. So, yes. Well, sometimes you, sometimes you just have to load up your magic wand. I mean, that's, you know, part of the trick is just knowing when to wave the magic wand. And, and in order to wave it, you have to actually have it loaded up and set, configured properly. So I'm in the process of configuring the magic wand. And then we'll just be able to start, you know, casting spells. Come join. Come listen. Come listen. Come listen. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. I actually have a magic wand collection. <laughs> you do? Do yes. you really? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I really do. <laughs> right, I have well, never heard now. of that. A magic wand collection. Oh, my God. <laughs> Do you have one of no. Harry Potter's? I got to ask you. No, oh. I don't. No. Well, your, your um, collection but, you is know, incomplete. It mean I won't. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. 
It doesn't mean I won't. Not yet is the correct answer. Not That's yet. right. Not yet. Right. So, so we're delving into Neville Goddard's book, Out of This World, and we're beginning chapter two during this podcast. Um, the title of this chapter is Assumptions Become Facts. Mm -hmm. And so that word assumption in the same sense of assuming the feeling Yes. Of the wish fulfilled. Good point. Um, men believe in the reality of the external world. I would say people, but yes. people believe in the reality of the external world because they do not know how to focus and condense their powers to penetrate its thin crust. I love this. Thin sentence. crust. Wow. <laughs> this book has only one purpose. The removing of the veil of the senses the traveling into another world. To remove the veil of the senses, we do not employ great effort. The objective world vanishes by turning our attention away from it. Interesting term, by the way, objective world. Mm -hmm. A world of objects. And it reminds me of that saying that we hear about um, whatever we resist persists yeah mm -hmm. the opposite of that is when we turn our attention away from it it falls away yes right it it vanishes exactly we we have only to concentrate on the state desired in order to mentally see it but to give it reality so that it will become an objective fact we must focus attention upon the invisible state until it has the feeling of reality this is what's so important about creating that vignette that we've been talking about mm -hmm. and then practicing it over and over. I've been practicing a particular little vignette for, I don't know, a few days, several times a day when I fall asleep at night. It's just gotten so crystal clear. Nice. And all of the feelings are coming into very sharp focus with it. So it's, you know, Interesting that the beginning of this sentence says we have only to concentrate on the state desired in order to mentally see it. But I think most people stop right there. Right? They're like, oh yeah, I'm focusing on it. I'm visioning it. And they're but done. He goes that, that's, what, that, that's what they're suge you're suggesting. They figure once they've gotten to that point, they figure they're done. Yeah. Because that's kind of a lot of the instruction that we get, right? Is that just see it in your mind. Yeah, that's true. Just see it in your mind's eye. But he says, but to to give it reality so that it will become an objective fact, we must focus attention upon the invisible state until it has the feeling of reality. That's going a bit further with it. It is, and, and it's very specific the way he says it. He starts off by saying focusing on, attention on the invisible state, but he emphasizes the end until it has the feeling of reality. That feeling, that's that's what we're going for. That That word feeling is actually the most important word in that phrase of his that you like to quote. Um, yeah, assuming, uh, assuming the, feeling. the feeling of the wish fulfilled. The, the feeling mm -hmm. part is the most important part. Yep. When through concentrated attention, our desire appears to possess the distinctness and feeling of reality, we have given it the right to become a visible concrete fact. The right. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. If it is difficult to control the direction of your attention while in a state akin to sleep, you may find gazing fixedly into an object very helpful. Huh. Do not look at its surface, but into and beyond any plain object, such as a wall, a carpet, or any other object which possesses depth. Do you know what he's talking about there? Have you tried that? Well, you know what it reminded me of when I, of course, I have a crystal ball on my desk and it kind of reminded me of that. Ah, okay. Yeah. But I don't think that's what he's saying. I don't think so. Um, not not a you, wall or a carpet anyway, <laughs> unless it's a crystal carpet. Those, <laughs> do you remember those things that used to be in the newspaper? And I think they were in books and I'm trying to think of what they, and they look all weird and you have to like, you have to relax your eyes and then it'll make a picture. Do you know oh what yeah. Yeah. About? Yeah. I can't remember what they're called, but I know what you mean. It's called yes. a magic something. Um, yeah. You do know a magic eye? I can't remember. They used to be in our newspaper, in the Sunday paper, and they would be in color, and they just look like static, all kinds of different. Yeah. If you allowed your eyes to relax and sort of look through the picture instead of looking at it, 
suddenly it would shift and it would you could see it was a picture of something and that's what it reminds me of it's a way of sort of um you're sort of almost losing focus i mean physically with your eye mm-hmm. not not mentally with your imagination but you're sort of looking at a he says a, a wall or a carpet or any object kind of just letting your eyes not focus um i've never tried this because i i don't have trouble with closing my eyes and imagining, but it may be a good thing. He says, he goes on to give a a direction about that. He says, arrange it to return as little reflection as possible. Imagine then that in this depth, you are seeing and hearing what you want to see and hear until your attention is exclusively occupied by the imagined state. At the end of your meditation, when you awake from your controlled waking dream, you'll feel as though you returned from a great distance. Now I have had that. I often have that sense when I am done with a meditation, but I've never tried this um, just controlling the direction of my gaze by looking at a surface because to me, that's like meditating with your eyes open. And I'm not sure if I'm really great at that. So well, actually, you may he, have to try it and report back. <laughs> well, 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 he he said specific, specifically, you don't look at the surface. You're trying to look through the object, which is where your idea about the magic eye thing. Mm-hmm. And by the way, that is what it's called. I looked it up. But that magic eye is about looking through it, which I've never been able to do successfully. By the way, I don't know about you. I, I look at them and all I see is noise. But <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm one of the mir- the the uh, minority, I guess, because I guess a lot of people can see stuff. Well, the weird thing about those is that for the longest time, I could not see anything. It would drive me crazy. Everybody else would say, can't you see it's a fish, you know, or whatever. And I'd be like, yeah, no, I, it's just not. <laughs> and then once I, once I did it once, then I could always do it again. Like, what do you think I, made the I, difference? I, I mean, wh- why were you able to see it one time and, or not see it one time and then see it the next time? Why do you think that I is? Think, well, I, I think at some point I, I did exactly what we're talking about here. I like relaxed my eyes enough to to kind of it's kind of like a spaced out kind of feeling where where suddenly I wasn't I wasn't trying to see anything you know when you look at something and you and you squint or you're really trying to see a fine detail and you're kind of laser focusing with your eyes in on that little spot you know I wasn't doing that at all I just sort of it was almost like I was looking at the entire picture at once Kind of like people who people who know how to speed read say, oh, I'd look at the whole page at once. I can see all the words at once. I don't go word by word by word. Um, it was sort of like that. I just would relax and look at the whole thing. And once I understood what I was doing to be able to see it, I never had a problem with it after that. Hmm. Okay. So, so I don't know. Um, I may try this, but I don't seem to have any problem with imagining otherwise. So I don't know if, if it's useful for me, but it may be useful for somebody listening. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. The visible world, which you had shut out, returns to consciousness and by its very presence (laughs) informs you that you have been self-deceived into believing that the object of your contemplation was real. (laughs) So it's like, welcome back. (laughs) Hmm. Yes. (laughs) Right. Welcome back. You still have the same job and the same bank account and the same (laughs) everything. Okay, I love this though. But if you know that consciousness is the one and only reality, you will remain faithful to your vision. And by this sustained mental attitude, confirm your gift of reality and prove that you have the power to give reality to your desires that they may become visible, concrete facts. That's that's one of the keys here. Is, so, so elaborate on that. What do you mean? Well, what I mean, and this has helped me so much to think of it the way we were speaking of earlier about a larger dimensional space, like when I am imagining, I am in that space and whatever I am imagining is actually happening there and it happens there first. And then if I, you know, if I stay with it, if I continue my practice, uh, those things will become hardened fact and present themselves in my 3D reality. And so when I'm there imagining and I'm meditating and then I finish and I come back, (laughs) come back to the world, (laughs) come back into the 3D world where things are what they are, Mm -hmm. I have one of two choices. I can say, 
oh, well, here I am and see those things are just an imagination and they're not real. Or I can, I can understand, no, um, that is actually the one and only reality. And I know what I just experienced. I assumed the feeling of the wish fulfilled. I could feel it. It was as real to me as ever. I And it's going to harden into fact. Okay. So I'm proving at that point that I'm faithful to my vision. Because it sounds to me like you're also proving to yourself that for a moment you convinced yourself that what we call the real world isn't real and the other world is the real one. And then you snap back to the real world and world says, oh, yeah, I'm back in the real world again. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's exactly what he's saying in this sentence before, right? He says the visible world, which you had shut out, returns to consciousness and by its very presence informs you. In other words, it, the, this reality here, I'm making air quotes, right? Or scare quotes. The reality says, ha ha, you are just lying to yourself, just an imagination. And that's our cue to make a stance to, to say, no, I, I actually do believe that what I'm doing in that dimensionally larger space where my imagination is working is that I am creating reality. And there's that time buffer that Abraham Hicks talks about. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the reference to self-deceived was kind of like a tease, a way of saying, we all know that when we try this stuff, it, at some point we say, yeah, I, I'm really faking it. I know the real world is real. But eventually yeah. what you're saying here is if you stick with it and, you, and you're really focusing on that other world, that uh, that imaginary world that you've created, you begin to believe it is at least as true, if not more true than the quote, real world. Right. And remember, we were talking about that a, a few podcasts ago. Um, we were talking about how when we, we were saying, well, if all potentialities are already there, like there was the, the chapter in the Neville book we read that was like, creation is finished. And we said, well, if creation is finished, if every reality is actually already in existence in some place in some parallel universe right well then why do we say we're creating and my answer to that was we i think it's actually a better choice of words to say we're choosing true yes and i think that this is the choice right here that we can either choose to stay where we are and believe that this is the only reality there is or we can choose to believe that what we're doing in that dimensionally larger space with our imagination is actually having an effect on our physical world and that there's a time, a little time gap there. So I, that's my choice. I choose that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. It, it hangs together. It, it takes a little getting used to the way he, he thinks about things, but yeah, it kind of makes sense. What you're really doing is you're not only shifting your attention from the real world to the imaginary world and, and making the imaginary world real, he's describing how that actually seems to turn into, yes, the imaginary, wor imaginary, the imaginary world really feels real to me. It feels even more real to, than, than the, quote, real world is. And as I am uh, adopting that viewpoint, as I'm accepting that viewpoint, all these interesting transitions are happening. These um, the manifestations are starting to create the the uh, um, the thing that we're imagining is turning in. What does he call it? He says it, it's hardening. It's hardening into something. Yeah, concrete. hardening into fact. Yeah, into hardening into fact. fact. Yeah. Now this next section, I'm I'm really excited to get your take on it. Okay. Um, I don't think it's hard to understand. I just I want to hear what you have to say about how this may apply. He says, define your ideal and concentrate your attention upon the idea of identifying yourself with your ideal. So there's your the aim again, right? It's like decide what you want mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and concentrate on the idea of having it, of identifying yourself with it. You are now the person that has that thing. Assume the feeling of being it, the feeling that would be yours were you already the embodiment of your ideal. And then live and act upon this conviction. This assumption, though denied by the senses, if persisted in, will become fact. Now, this is the part that I really can't wait to hear what you think about it. Okay. Because we've covered that before. Right. We, we, we start telling a different story. We identify ourselves with it. Um, and we, we live in that space. 
then he says, you will know when you have succeeded in fixing the desired state in consciousness by simply looking mentally at the people you know. In dialogues with yourself, you are less inhibited and more sincere than in actual conversations with others. Therefore, the opportunity for self-analysis arises when you're surprised by your mental conversations with others. If you see them as you formerly saw them, you've not changed your concept of self. For all changes of concepts of self result in a changed relationship to your world. In your meditation, allow others to see you as they would see you were this new concept of self a concrete fact. You always seem to others an embodiment of the ideal you inspire. Therefore, in meditation, when you contemplate others, you must be seen by them mentally as you would be seen by them physically were your concept of self an objective fact. That is, in meditation, you imagine that they see you expressing that which you desire to be. Okay. Now, this reminds me of, of the little vignette that, that he um, mentioned earlier where the person wanted to have a new job or a promotion at work. So they, the vignette, the, the little drama that they created was, okay, I'm going to imagine that someone, a friend of mine, is congratulating me for getting this new job. Mm-hmm. They reach out, they shake my hand, they say, great job. Wow, so proud of you. You're, you. you're doing great. This is wonderful. Right. Okay. Is that what he's talking about here? Because that's what I... That's what it seems to be for me is that in our imagination, in our meditations, when we imagine others in our life, people we know, or maybe people we don't, I don't know, that they will be responding to us as if we had that thing. Well, the showstopper for me was the word mentally. And that first sentence that you pointed to, you said it, it reads like this. You will know when you have succeeded in fixing the desired state in consciousness by simply looking mentally at the people you know. And I'm, right. I sat there thinking to myself, what does he mean by that? And he kind of right. explains it as you went on with the next three paragraphs. In fact, I think it was the, the third paragraph after that where it really started to become quite a bit more clear. Let's see, which sentence was it? Therefore, in meditation, when you contemplate others, you must be seen by them mentally as you would be seen by them physically were your concept of self an objective fact. Well, that part gets a little confusing too. But the mentally part, that suggests to me it's in the imagination. It's in the, the meditative okay. imagination that that's where the mentally part applies. So going back to that first sentence, looking mentally at the people, you know, to me means looking at Imagine. those people within the imagination. Okay. Okay. That, that is what I thought too. And I was like, you know, sometimes we'll discuss something and uh, some other ideas surface, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. Oh, wow. So I thought, okay, I want to make sure I have a handle on this. This is the way I read it as well. Okay. So when when we're imagining people that we know, um, they will be responding to us even in our imaginal conversations, the way they would if this thing had come to pass. Mm-hmm. Okay. Whatever it is. Okay. Um, but there's there's also more here, and and I'm not even sure how to go about looking at because these these sentences are very abstruse. But let's see if I can find it. In your meditation, allow others to see you as they would see you were this new concept of self a concrete fact. So the new concept of self, I'm gathering that's the vignette. That's the imagined state that we're, we're generating in our minds. So to rephrase this, in your meditation, allow the other people in the meditation to see you as they would see you were this meditated vignette that we're creating actually be part of of the objective world. If it were part of the objective world, they would look you at, at the, the people that you know would look at you at a, in a certain way. So in your meditation, have those same people look at you in that same way. That's the way I'm seeing it. Right. And the, uh, you know, the example that came to me was from his, from his own description of wanting a promotion at work. Mm-hmm. Right. So I thought, so maybe there's a person that at work that you see at your job that is like, a level above you in management or something. And you're desiring a promotion that would put you on like the same level or the same team. So when you think of that person mentally, 
just in your imagination, or you have some kind of conversation in your imagination that would include them, it's important that now they are seeing you in your imagination as on the same level and no longer as you're at a level beneath them or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think that part of that, because we all have mental conversations, not out like I'm talking about outside of our meditative state, right? That it's important that naturally they start to be shaping up to fit the desire being fulfilled. I agree. But I think there's also something else here too. That last paragraph it has, it, we, I, we didn't quite get to the second sentence when I reread it, but let me get to that second sentence. The first sentence says, in your meditation and allow others to see you as they would see you were this new concept of a self, a concrete fact. So what we basically okay. just described. Second part, you always seem to others an embodiment of the ideal you inspire. And always suggests to me whether you're interacting in the physical world or whether you're interacting with them in your imaginary world. Mm -hmm. Either way, the rest of the sentence applies. And the rest of the sentence is, you always seem to others an embodiment of the ideal you inspire. And an embodiment of the ideal you inspire. So the person, in the view of others, that person being you, they see you as your ideal. That's what he's saying there. And I'm, I don't quite get why he's talking about your ideal, unless he is saying in some way this vignette that you're creating of this, this thing that you want to come into your life, that is the ideal he's referring to. That's the only way I can connect it. I mean, do you see it another way? No. I see, well, I see it two different ways. One way I see it, and it's a, I would word it a little different, but you always seem to others an embodiment of the ideal you inspire. It's like others see you in the light that is that story that we tell about ourselves. Okay. It's what it's whatever we're embodying, right? And so I think it that way is when he's talking about the physical. Um, but I, I think it's more what you just said, because we're talking about in meditation and we're talking about I mean, he uses the word meditation like three times in this paragraph. So, yes, I think exactly what, what you're saying is that the ideal that we're inspired to, that thing that we're wanting to create, that's the way we need to seem to others in our imaginal space. And he suggests that even in the physical space, that's the way we do seem to others. That's really interesting. Yeah, that's the part that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like tripping over it. Well, I mean, that's really actually cool. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, he is letting us know that the ideal that we're inspiring, that that's how other people are seeing us. It's almost Maybe like he's it's saying that... for us to see ourselves that way too. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it's almost like he's saying that since... In the objective real world, people we know when they see us, and like you said, I, I love the way you expressed it, that they're, that they're seeing us in terms of the stories we tell about ourselves. So when we tell the, the, the ideal story or, or the story that we're trying to bring into reality through our imagination, when we tell that story to them, they see us as that story even before we do. I think that's what he's hinting at there. And so he's I saying, so he's suggesting leverage that, take advantage of the fact that they see us that way and kind of use that in the in your imagination so that in your imagination, they see you the same way too. And it reinforces the very thing you're trying to make real in your feeling and in your thought. Yeah. You know, that word, therefore, that's exactly why it's there. Okay. I mean, I think you're, you've hit the nail on the head here. It's like, you know what? Others pick up on this even maybe before you do. Yeah. And this this thing you're creating, others will see it because you always seem to others an embodiment of the ideal you inspire. So therefore, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's just what you said. It's like leverage this. <laughs> right. Well, I, I, can, I can actually turn that into a concrete example from my life, which is the podcast. All of you guys who are my co-hosts keep telling me over and over again, and have been for many months now, how successful you think this whole project of, of uh, an ongoing, growing podcast is going to be. And I'm the one who believes it the least. I do believe it, 
but my confidence level hasn't been as good as yours. And what he's suggesting is leverage your confidence level. You know, okay, in the, in the story that I'm telling myself, just keep reminding myself, Cindy believes it, Wendy believes it, Joel believes it, Tom believes it. I mean, Linda believes it, Patty believes it, everybody believes it. It must be true. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I love this. <laughs> and it's the ideal that you inspired. Yes, I did. And still yeah. am. And I'm still right. blown away by it. <laughs> Therefore, in meditation, when you contemplate others, you must be seen by them mentally as you would be seen by them physically were your concept of self an objective fact. Mm. Yeah, it's now it's starting to make more sense. Yeah. Yep. Well, I'm glad you brought your decoder ring because that took a while. But <laughs> <laughs> That is, in meditation, you imagine that they see you expressing that which you desire to be. So in your meditation, you imagine that we see you as the developer of an amazingly successful LOA podcast. Right, right. Yeah, and we do. Mm -hmm. So that should help in your imagination that you see us seeing you that way, right? Well, it, it, it's a good reminder, too, because yeah. I don't always remember that. You know, right. at, at times when I'm trying to visualize getting us to 10,000 listeners per episode, which is definitely where I want us to get to soon, I, I don't always remember that you guys feel that way about it. So it's a good point. I mean, when I'm doing my imaginations, I should be imagining each of you guys um, reinforcing that and seeing in a clear way, maybe clear more clearly than I am, that that has already happened. And that is the well, now, know, right now. What's interesting about that too is, and and it's not, I don't see this as a like fake it till you make it kind of thing, right? But no, not I at all. Is, in other words, like whatever it is that I aspire to, um, it really does build my confidence to think or to know or to imagine that my friends, that other people I'm connected with, that they see that in me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that there's a power in that. that. That's really the power of the placebo. The placebo is believing somebody else who you think is in some way an authority on the subject that doing X will make you feel better or heal you or or help you to succeed or whatever it is. That's the placebo effect. And and right. that really isn't fake it till you make it. That's simply believing in what somebody else is telling you. Yeah. So if you assume that you are what you want to be, your desire is fulfilled. Yeah. And in fulfillment, all longing is neutralized. You cannot continue desiring what you have already realized. Your desire is not something you labor to fulfill. It is recognizing something you already possess. It is assuming the feeling of being that which you desire to be. Believing and being are one. And this kind of goes back to what we spoke of earlier, that we're not actually creating as much as we're choosing. Mm. So if we've made that choice to choose that thing, we're not going to continue to desire it because we've chosen it. And you cannot continue desiring what you've already realized. The conceiver and his conception are one. Therefore, that which you conceive yourself to be can never be so far off as even to be near, for nearness implies separation. Ah, it's not even, it's not even near. It is here. It is you. Well, you then, are one with whatever you're conceiving to be. That's, the, that's part of the now principle, really. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yes, yes, yes to that. Uh, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Being is the substance of things hoped, the evidence of things not seen. He changed that one up. That's usually translated as faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. <laughs> he says being is the substance. Uh, I like his version. See, see this is where it's really helpful to have a biblical scholar holding the Neville Goddard decoder ring. It makes a real big <laughs> difference. If you assume that you are what you want to be, then you will see others as they are related to your assumption. If, however, it is the good of others that you desire, then in meditation you must represent them to yourself is already being that which you desire them to be. 
Remember when we were reading, I think we were back in um, Money and the Law of Attraction, if I remember correctly. And there was a bit in there about when you're about how you can help someone else. Yeah. And it said, you know, if your thoughts are helping someone by how you feel when you think of them, Mm -hmm. if you feel good when you're thinking about them or if you don't. And I thought, oh, my gosh, like people that are in my life that I really want something better for them than what I see. What am I how am I picturing them? Am I feeling sorry for them? Am I worrying for them? Or am I seeing them right here? What he says is as already achieving that thing. If, if it's the good of others you desire, then in meditation, you must represent them to yourself as already being that which you desire them to be. Hmm. Already seeing their success, already seeing their healing and their health and their prosperity and their happiness and mm-hmm. whatever. Right. Yeah. yeah it is true. through it is through desire that you rise above your present sphere, and the road from longing to fulfillment is shortened as you experience in imagination what you would experience in the flesh, were you already the embodiment of the ideal you desire to be. Now I like this part. The road from longing to fulfillment is shortened. Yeah, and it's that's short- what we want, right? And it's shortened in a very specific way, right? It's, it's shortened through, uh, as he says, it's, it is through the desire that you rise above your present sphere and the road from longing to fulfillment is shortened as you experience in imagination what you would experience in the flesh where you already, the, embodied, the embodiment of the ideal you desire to be. So the activity, I think is what he's saying, the activity of desiring that you rise above your present sphere, the, the road from longing to fulfillment is shortened because you're doing that. You know, right, because you're feeling it, because you're experiencing it, because you're yep. you're you're a part of it, and like you said, you're doing it now. You're not projecting it in the future. You're not worrying about what happened in the past. You're not wondering if it's going to be okay that you included somebody else in your manifestation <laughs> attempt or anything like that. You're simply right. just there. You're right there. And I have to say that since I've been doing this this particular way and recognizing the now of it. Um, I am so energized and I am feeling so great. It's definitely made a difference. Wow. And it's made a difference in my expectation of pretty much everything. Like I don't have the things that I started uh, through desire on this track. I I don't have, it's like they're here already. I'm not longing for them. Like, Which is I'm very excited. Good. Yeah, yeah, it's cause, amazing. Because because that's the part that often really trips a lot of people up. I know it trips me up because I still get locked in. I, I can feel the desire going on, right? And I think that actually is one of the reasons I do have the most trouble, uh, or, or that is one of the times I have the most trouble uh, assuming the feeling. Because that assuming the feeling part is critical, and the, and. I mean, there are times when I just, I, I don't even know what the feeling is at all. It's kind of similar to what I experienced when uh, I, I've been practicing and trying to learn how to communicate with the inner being, with with my with the inner part of myself. And Wendy mm-hmm. Dillard at one point made a really good uh, point. She pointed out that I really am in communication if I can just remember that every time I put a thought to myself and it feels really, really good inside, that the answer is Yes. And if mm-hmm. it doesn't feel really good inside, the answer is no. And I forget that. But <laughs> nevertheless, it, it is an indication I'm getting uh, communication. I, I tend to think like um, I want to hear words in my head in some way, right? D- d- you know, is this the right way to go? Yes, no, no, try this instead. Mm-hmm. But instead, the messages that I can count on as, and always interpret correctly is if I put it inside, how does it feel? If it feels good, the answer is positive. If it doesn't feel good, the, the answer is negative. And that makes it a, a much easier way to deal with it. Well, it, we aren't talking about a, a, a communication thing of positive and, and negative when we're talking about getting into the feeling of it and, and getting in, into the feel of it right now, in the now. But when we focus on it in, in terms of things like including other people into the imagination and having some idea of how they would respond to this, this story that we're telling in the process of creating this little vignette, 
and 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 we have a good idea of how they would behave and what you know what they would say and would they be smiling would they be shaking our hands would they be patting us on the back you know would they be stabbing us on the back what would they be doing <laughs> whatever it is <laughs> you know you, that that actually helps to create the scene and the more you create the scene the feeling does start to come through i i mean I, I guess i'm saying this because i i recognize that there are many times when i can't get to that feeling but those times when the feeling does come through are the times when i have enough detail that seems concrete to me even though it's in my imagination that for a brief instant all of that feeling pops in that's why i think it's so important and so awesome actually that that this method is about creating a small little vignette a little a small scene you know it's like if you were a, a a screenwriter and you were writing this scene it would just be a couple of sentences yeah right it would be you know it would be you meet a friend who congratulates you for your new job and thank goodness because even that alone is enough work to create that try to create something larger it's going to become overwhelming so thank goodness <laughs> well, it's small well i think the fact that it's small allows you to you know, sort of like when you're trying to memorize um, a line or a verse or a quote, mm -hmm. you know, if it's if it's pages long, it's difficult. Yeah. But if it's just a few words, like an affirmation, you can memorize it to the point where you can say it over and over. This is like a 3D affirmation, right? Because we're <laughs> a 3D we affirmation. Are acting it out. You know, yeah. it's not just words. It's we're acting it out in our imagination, we're shaking that person's hand or whatever it is. And when we do that little action over and over and over, the feeling will come. Um, and, and I think it's easier to recognize it and memorize it. That's really what we're kind of wanting to do, right? Is not just memorize the, the line. We don't want to just memorize our lines here, but we want to memorize the feeling. Yeah. We so want to be the method actor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, let's see. So, he says, I've stated that man has at every moment of time the choice before him which of several futures he will encounter. But the question arises, how is that possible when the experiences of man awake in the three-dimensional world are predetermined as his observation of an event before it occurs implies? This ability to change the future will be seen if we liken the experiences of of life on earth to this printed page man experiences events on earth singly and successively in the same way that you are now experiencing the words of this page imagine that every word on this page represents a single sensory impression to get the context to understand my meaning you focus your vision of the first word in the upper left hand corner and then move your focus across the page from left to right letting it fall on the words singly and successively. By the time your eyes read the last word on the page, you've extracted my meaning. Suppose, however, on looking at the page with all the printed words thereon equally present, you decide to rearrange them. <laughs> you could, by rearranging them, tell an entirely different story. In fact, you could tell many different stories. A dream is nothing more than uncontrolled four-dimensional thinking. <laughs> or the rearrangement of both past and future sensory impressions. Man seldom dreams of events in the order in which he experiences them while awake. He usually dreams of two or more events which are separated in time, fused into a single sensory impression, or in his dream, he so completely rearranges his single waking sensory impressions that he does not recognize them when he encounters them in his waking state. Now, this is interesting. He says, for example, I dreamed that I delivered a package to the restaurant in my apartment building. The hostess said to me, you can't leave that there. Whereupon the elevator operator gave me a few letters. And as I thanked him for them, he in turn thanked me. And at this point, the night elevator operator appeared and waved a greeting to me. The following day, as I left my apartment, I picked up a few letters, which had been placed at my door. On my way down, I gave the day elevator operator a tip and thanked him for taking care of my mail, whereupon he thanked me for the tip. On my return home that day, I overheard a doorman say to a delivery man, you can't leave that there. 
And as I was about to take the elevator up to my apartment, I was attracted by a familiar face in the restaurant. And as I looked in, the hostess greeted me with a smile. Late that night, I escorted my dinner guests to the elevator. And as I said goodbye to them, the night operator waved goodbye to me. By simply rearranging a few of the single sensory impressions I was destined to encounter, and by fusing two or more of them into single sensory impressions, I constructed a dream, which differed quite a bit from my waking experience. When we've learned to control the movements of our attention in the four-dimensional world, we shall be able to consciously create circumstances in the three-dimensional world. How did you like that analogy? (laughs) Well, it's an interesting analogy, I guess. Uh, A a few things occur to me here. And I I think it has kind of a double meaning to it also. The the first thing that that occurs to me is that, no disrespect to Neville at all, but he's really not a very good storyteller. So his stories are a little bit disjointed. And he, he leaves stuff unsaid that you have to kind of fill in the blanks about what happened the value of that however is that it enables us to pretty quickly see how there is the similarity very strong similarity between his waking experience and what he imagined i guess it was actually a dream sequence i I can't remember if yes it was a dream sequence right right so he, he he starts by saying which i thought was like wow um, he starts by saying that a dream, and I, I think he's speaking of our nighttime dreams. Right, right. He says a dream is nothing more than uncontrolled four-dimensional thinking. <laughs> Which is a cute <laughs> phrase, yeah, no doubt. Right, so what he's encouraging us to do is in these waking dreams, in these imaginations, is to control them. Because he's saying that the things we dream in our nighttime dreams are pieced together from past and present and future sensory, you know, experiences we have. And so he's encouraging us to focus enough to where we can actually, like you said, tell a better story, right? Tell a good story um, that we create and have, have those fourth dimensional stories and imaginings come into our three dimensional experience. It's it's pretty wild. It, well, it's very wild, no doubt about that. It, it's also a little intimidating because it sounds like he's saying rearrange it in the dream. And I've never been very good at rearranging things in my dream. My dream just kind of flows through me and there it is. I don't feel like I have a whole lot of control over it. Well, I think he is he is using the nighttime dream just as an example, saying that what he wants us to do is to be able to constructed in our waking dream in other words not the nighttime dream but the imaginal place that we go to when we meditate okay you think that's what he's saying all right and then once once we can arrange those things then we will have learned to control the movements of our attention okay well yeah there's that's that's true because if you do take the elements of the dream and rearrange them that is a direct control especially if it plays out that way but that, that's one of the parts that's missing from the description. I mean, he, he implies it, but he actually doesn't really say anywhere, take this dream and rearrange it into what's going to happen. He simply says the following day, here's what happened. Right. So he says, when we've learned to control the movements of our attention in the four dimensional world, we'll be able to consciously create circumstances in the three dimensional world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. I was, so I, I, I was trying to read from what, from the text, from the prose, what, sequence of events he followed and that's where i said it was disjointed it was like there was there was there were chunks missing and the, and the biggest chunk that was missing was he didn't actually talk about how he rearranged that dream sequence he just simply said it rearranged and then and he didn't even say that much he just described what it rearranged into yeah i don't even think it was conscious it may not have been yeah and if it wasn't <laughs> conscious if it well that's the thing though if it wasn't conscious then Who's doing the rearranging? <laughs> exactly. Well, we want to be doing it consciously. We That's do. The point of this book. <laughs> yes, exactly. Neville's keeping us busy this week. I should say. <laughs> Very busy. <laughs> and I thought we'd get to the end of the chapter, but I think we're going to have to pick up. Yeah, we've completely up. run out of time, but we'll, we'll pick this up <laughs> next week. This has been great. Thank you for doing it with me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I've had fun too. And we will see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everyone.